So back in the uh, 1800s, um, most of you weren't around back then, um, back in the 1800s, there was this big push from countries to try and conquer and claim the North and the South Pole. They wanted to claim it for their country, right? Uh, and so we uh, saw different, in the history books, saw different groups of people that tried to do that. In 1879, there was a guy by the name of Lieutenant George DeLong who decided he was going to be the one to conquer and to claim the North Pole for the United States. Um, Others had tried, and they ran into some issues along the way in which they couldn't get there. Because you see, the, the map makers and the scientists, they believed that it was open ocean, open sea, right to the North Pole where you could sail smoothly like you would any other ocean like the Caribbean or Mediterranean or anything like that. These previous expeditions that sailed north in search of this open sea ran into a big problem. Ice. <laughs> the map makers, for some reason, didn't understand that there would be ice here. And you would think when they would come back and say, we ran into this giant sheet of ice, they would adjust their theory and maybe abandon it and move to something else. But they simply made a tweak to it and they said, well, it must just be a small circle of ice around the North Pole and there's a gap in the ice that you can get through and then you'll have smooth sailing the rest of the way to the North Pole. So DeLong and his crew, they sought to find this gap in the ice. They sought to find the North Pole. And it didn't take long for DeLong to realize that all of the map makers and the scientists that made this map were wrong again because he found that the ice seemed to stretch forever. Right? And this time, DeLong and his crew, they, they came to the fact that they were given false information and their ship was trapped in ice. And so they abandoned the ship and they started walking over the ice to try and find Siberia. At one point, the crew got separated. Uh, some of the crew made it to, to Siberia and some of the crew didn't. They continued walking and they ended up dying of starvation. And so DeLong, he was one that died in the snow and ice. So what we, what we see in this story is that the wrong map cost DeLong, some, and him and some of his men, cost them their lives, right? Now, most of us are not trying to get to the North Pole every day, um, but we are still traveling a journey in life, and for that journey, we need a map. We need a map that we can trust, a map that can guide us in the right direction. So today we're going to continue on, as, as Pastor Lance mentioned, in our DNA series where we're looking at our values and identity statements. Uh, over the last two weeks, we've taken the time to look at the values of grace and love. And we have talked about how grace is this free gift from God, how it is not anything that we can earn or achieve ourselves. We simply receive it. Uh, and then we've talked about love, how we are called first to love God, but then also to love others as Jesus did. And so this week, we're going to look at our next value of biblical truth. Biblical truth. Uh, and so this is the title for the message today, but if you look in your blue bulletins, there's some fill-in-the-blanks or some main points in there. This is the first point for today, is biblical truth. Now, uh, let me pause just for a second and um, jump, uh, piggyback off of what Eugene was saying. We're going to we're going to pause on this series next week as we celebrate our 150th anniversary of Shore Church here. Um, and so for that service, uh, it's going to be a service filled with celebrating God's, God's faithfulness over 150 years. Uh, and so in this, it's... It, the service is going to look different than normal. Um, there's going to be uh, different aspects to it. Uh, there's going to be no Sunday school, and then we're going to move outside. There's going to be a tent that's going to have a meal, games, all, all kinds of different things to create and foster relationships as God has provided for us over the last 150 years. So uh, really looking forward to what that will look like. Another point in that, if you haven't already, there's a table of t-shirts out there. Please grab one of those. Those are free for you to take. Uh, and we encourage you to wear those next week. Um, then we can all match. It'll be so fun. <laughs> all right. Back to our, uh, to our, a, our value here of biblical truth. Um, the identity statement that coincides with 
the value biblical truth. Uh, here it is. We are people who are led by biblical truth. Again, it's a simple statement, yet it's foundational for us as we move forward. So we are people who are led by biblical truth. So if we look at this statement, uh, a word that I want to draw attention to to start with is the word led, right? So to be led means that we are following something, right? If you're driving down the road and you have your GPS or maybe your atlas, um, who, ha- who still has an atlas? Wow, more than I expected. All right. Uh, if you have a GPS or an atlas and you're following it, that means you are being led by that thing, by that GPS or that atlas. And so we have to ask the question, who or what is leading us in this life? What are we following? And so that brings us back to the idea of we need to have a map or a guide that we can trust. And so that's what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, And in doing that, majority of our time we're going to spend in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. So if if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and start flipping there. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. While you're turning there, I'm going to take some time just to give you some context of what we're looking at in this passage here today surrounding this passage. Uh, these set of verses. So the author of this letter that we're looking at today is the Apostle Paul. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy as a way to further equip him in leading the church in Ephesus. Okay, So that's the entirety of the letter. But if we zoom in specifically on the chapter in which we find our passage from today, Paul is telling Timothy that there will be times of difficulty that will come up. There's going to be people that will try to persuade you to go in different directions. There's going to be people that will persecute you and cause you to suffer. There's people that will come in that will be imposters that will try to deceive you and to deceive other people. So he says, this is the situation. This is the reality of what's going to happen in the church of Ephesus in which you're leading. But here is my encouragement for you in this. And that's where we pick up today. So Matt, or I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 3 14 through 17. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, you can find the words in your bulletin or on the screen behind me as well. So we're going to go ahead and read this passage, starting in verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which you are able to, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So Paul starts this passage by saying, but as for you, okay, so this is a kind of a contrast phrase that points backwards to those things that we just mentioned before, the um, people that are deceiving, people that are imposters, people that are persecuting. So, but as for you, don't be like them, but instead, my encouragement for you is to be different, to be led by something else. My encouragement for you is to be led and to continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, right? So Paul is pointing Timothy in a different direction than everything that he is or will experience. So he's saying, Timothy, you have a solid map to follow. You've already learned the things of this map, of this guide. So follow these things. You have a map that you can trust. And the map that he's talking about is the sacred writings that Timothy learned as a child. So as we look at this idea, we see something interesting that Paul mentions and includes in this. Uh, In verse 14, the, he uses the phrase, continue in what you have learned and, and knowing from whom you learned it. Okay, I think this, this phrase here is all too intentional for Paul to just have included it without any meaning behind it. So Paul is saying, Timothy, remember what you've learned. Right? That seems obvious. Remember what you've learned, the knowledge and the understanding that you've gained. But then he also says, remember who you learned it from. This is a a really interesting thing for Paul to say, I think. Remember who you learned. Remember how they followed the sacred writings. Remember how they followed the map. Remember how they saw and recognized God's faithfulness. Remember how God worked in their lives. 
Right? And in this, Paul was almost certainly referring to Timothy's mother and his grandmother, both which we see in other parts of Scripture where they t- it talks about how they raised Timothy up, how they taught him in the ways of the Scriptures. But Paul's also, I think, referring to himself, right? because Paul spent a lot of time to mentor and to teach Timothy, to train him up in the position that he is in. So the testimony of who lived out the sacred writings is nearly as important as the testimony of the sacred writings themselves. I didn't say they're as important, but they're nearly as important, right? To see how other people live that out is incredibly important for us to know and understand, oh, that's what that looks like, right? So first, we have to understand what the sacred writings are, understand what they teach, gain that knowledge, but then we see it, and it's reinforced in the people that are around us. And so I think what this tells us is two things. We need people in our lives that are living out these sacred writings. We need people who are following God's map that we can look to as a testimony and as a reminder and say, yes, I can trust it. I can trust God's word in this. I can trust where it is leading us. But then on the flip side, we need to be people that are firmly living out what the word says. We need to be people that are mentoring other people who can see, well, that's what that looks like. That's what it looks like to follow the map. That's what it looks like to use God's word as a guide. Who are the people that we're mentoring that need to see that? Who are the people that need to see we trust God's word? And so a realistic piece of being led by biblical truth, and having that be a part of our DNA as a church is, how do we do this together? How does one generation lead the other generation in being faithful to following the map, to being faithful to God's word? Encouraging each other to continue in what they've learned and believed. Now, we see that Paul, he tells Timothy that he needs to continue in what he's learned uh, from the sacred writings, okay? So, the sacred writings are the the map to follow here. Now, uh, there's some debate, actually, uh, among the church and scholars as to what exactly Paul was referring to when he said the sacred writings, right? Some people say that Paul would have only been referring to the Old Testament scriptures here, uh, because that's what would have been officially recognized as scripture during that time when Paul was writing this, right? Other people say by that time, by the time Paul was writing this to, to Timothy, there would have been other writings by the apostles that would have been circulated, and they would have been used as uh, teaching tools and would have had authority among people. And so he needed to Uh, pay attention to those as well. So that Paul might have been referring to the Old Testament and then parts of what would have been established in the New Testament already. Now, I really don't know what the correct interpretation is on that, I'll be honest with you. Um, But if I'm even more honest with you, I'm not sure it matters a ton, actually, because I think it leads us to the same point. Uh, The reason being is that we know the primary reason and purpose behind the Old Testament scriptures is to point to Jesus. And we also know that the primary reason and purpose of the New Testament scriptures is to point to Jesus, right? All of it points to him. That is the purpose of the scriptures. And so whether it's just the Old Testament or whether it's the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's still pointing towards Jesus. And so because Timothy has this knowledge of Jesus' death and his resurrection, we can see how the sacred writings and his knowledge of Jesus make him wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, as it says here in verse 15. So either interpretation gets us to the same point. Now, for us today, we have the privilege of having a full book of writings that have been compiled that we call the Bible. Um, something that I want you to know about the, this book called the Bible is um, it did not fall out of the sky nice and neat with a leather-bound cover and a cross printed on the front, right? That's not how the Bible came to be. And I think sometimes there's a misconception within the church of this floated down from heaven on a, on a cloud and it was handed to us, right? That's not how the Bible was created. Instead, there was 
an intentional process that required intentional guidance of the Holy Spirit to compile different writings into what we have today. Right? The Bible has 66 different books that are compiled together by 40 or so authors, different authors. It's not the same person writing all of these down, 40 or so different authors. And so there's this process over many years in which the Bible, these writings were compiled together. Now, there's so much uh, depth to the process of getting the Bible here. There's way more than what we can mention today. And so if that's interesting to you or you want more info, uh, come talk to me. I'd love to have a conversation with you about that at some point. So in this, um, I think as we, for the sake of our time today, what we know is that we can trust that the Holy Spirit was involved in the process of taking all of these writings, compiling them to what we have today. Right? The Holy Spirit was involved in that process intentionally and intricately. And so because of that, we can trust what is compiled in this book. Right? If we can trust the Holy Spirit, we can trust what's in here because the Holy Spirit was working in the creation of this. And so the other thing that we can say with absolute certainty is that the sacred writings that are in this book are able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, right? That's what the scripture says, this verse, makes us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That, I think that is the most important piece of this book. The most important piece is that it points us to Jesus, it points us to that relationship. It points us to the, the saving grace, to the love, right? All of these values that we've been talking about, this book points us to that. So today, we can read through the Old Testament. We can see how it points us to Jesus. We can read through the New Testament. We can see how it describes uh, the map that leads us to life now with Jesus and then also eternal life with him later. So the fact that the, the writings of the Bible lead us to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ shows us that this map can be trusted and we can allow it to lead us. So this is our first point in the bulletin. We are led by scripture because of its message, right? The message of Jesus in this book, that is why we can be led by scripture because we can trust the message, so we know that if we take the words from Paul, when he tells Timothy that to continue in what you have learned and what you have believed, if we can take these words for ourselves and say, continue in what you have learned and what you, and what you believe, we know that it will make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. And so Jesus is the main character of the story, right? That's one of the most important things for us to understand in reading scripture and understanding how we are led by biblical truth is Jesus is the main character. Jesus is the hero, not us. Right? We're a piece of the story and the relationship that we have with him, but Jesus is the main character. He's the hero of the story. Now I'll uh, rabbit trail just here for one second. One dangerous trend that I have seen over the years is that people will end up putting more faith in the book than they do Jesus. I think that's a, a dangerous thing for, for people who take, the, who take the Bible very, very seriously. And, and hear me, we have to take the Bible very, very seriously, but there's this temptation to rely more on this than, than on Jesus. And so that's something that we have to be careful of. We can't put more faith in the book than we do in the person that the book describes and points us to, right? Our faith has to be in Jesus, not the words, but the word is the map to him. So in our lives, the main reason that we want to be people who are led by biblical truth is because the main message of biblical truth is Jesus. So we have to ask ourselves, what is, what effect does this message have on my life as an individual? How has this message changed me, shaped me, transformed me? Where has it led me? Right? Do I live in such a way? Do I continue in the firm belief that I, that I have in, that I've gained from the sacred writings and staying steadfast in the message of Jesus? But also as a church, 
is the message of Jesus something that's found within our DNA? Is it what's found in who we are? I believe it needs to be if it isn't. Because the message of Jesus, as it's found in the scriptures, needs to be deeply woven into our DNA, into who we are. Because the message is how we learn about who Jesus is and what he has done for us. So, we are led by biblical truth because of the message. Now, if we look at verse 16, continuing on, we see verse 16 might be one of the most important scriptures that we have in understanding the Bible. Uh, Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God. Now, to be honest, this may sound kind of uh, strange if we think about it, to be breathed out by God. It's not a phrase that we used in our common everyday language, I don't think. Uh, And part of the reason for that is in the Greek, Paul made up a new Greek word to describe this. It's thought that Paul coined this word to be breathed by God because it's such a unique concept that Paul had to make a new word for it. So let's unpack it a little bit. So uh, one of the other ways that Bible versions use to translate this is this idea of being inspired by God. To to be breathed out is this idea of to be inspired by God. But the Greek word has this literal literal meaning of God breathed. So it's sort of like a compound word. The first part of the word is God and the second part of the word is breathed. So this isn't just your everyday concept. And so the reality is that to a certain extent... There is a beautiful mystery to the writing of Scripture that we may never fully understand on this side of heaven, right? We we will probably never fully, fully understand how the Scriptures were written, how they were God-breathed on this side of heaven, And, and I think that's okay. I think there's a mystery there that we are allowed to wrestle with and to uh, trust God in His story. Uh, But what we do know is that the Scriptures that in the scriptures that the authors were somehow supernaturally influenced by the Holy Spirit in what they were writing, right? So so what this means is that that through the Holy Spirit, God used people to write his word. God used people to write his word. Now, uh, we know from studying the scriptures uh, intensely that that God used the author's styles. He used their vocabulary, right? The Greek vocabulary that Paul used is different than the Greek vocabulary that Peter used. He used their uh, natural characteristics and their personality. He didn't erase them. They weren't zombies writing these things down. But instead, he used their experiences, right? He used uh, the things that he had allowed them to go through to create and to write this message. So the reality is that the Bible really has two authors, God and humanity, right? Um, There's more than one human that wrote it, but those are the two things that were uh, involved in the creation of this. So uh, the next point that we can say is we are led by Scripture because of its origin. We are led by Scripture because of its origin. And so again, because the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit's involvement, the Holy Spirit was intricate, intricately involved in this, because of, the, of this origin, we can trust the accuracy, we can trust the contents that are contained in the Scriptures. And so for us to be a church that's led by biblical truth is a church that trusts the origin of the Scriptures themselves. So if we jump back to verse 16, uh, we see that Paul says that all scriptures are profitable for, he lists these four things, teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. Now he says all four of these things are profitable, okay? So in general, the word profit uh, is taken as a good thing, right? To profit something means you gain something, right? So we see some of these things may not always seem very good or great, right? They might seem kind of hard, but we know that Paul is saying that they are still good. They are still profitable, even if they are hard in the moment. So let's take a look at these. So the first is teaching. I think we're all fairly familiar with the idea of teaching. To be taught something means that you gain knowledge or understanding, right? We can learn about who Jesus is and his mission through the teachings of the scripture. We can learn what is right and what is wrong. We can learn how we fit into God's story of redemption and restoration, right? These are all definitely positive things. These are things that we can profit from the scripture's teachings. The second thing that Paul lists is reproof, 
Right? This is uh, maybe not a, the most common word that we use. Another way that might be helpful to give you the same understanding here is this idea of convicting of sin right? or rebuking. So essentially, this is the process of being made aware of sin. Now, this doesn't seem like a very uh, positive thing necessarily or a profitable thing uh, because being made aware of sin in our lives is a hard thing, right? That means we have somehow been convicted of this through the Holy Spirit or somebody else or through the scriptures of I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing. That can be a really hard thing. But at the end, it's still profitable because it leads us closer to Jesus. So even though it's hard, it's still profitable. The third thing that Paul mentions is is correcting. Right? This is taking the reproof or the conviction of sin, and it's giving it a path or a goal towards recovery, towards something different. So this is an encouragement to return back to the ways of Jesus. Right? You're convicted of the sin, now let's, let's return to where Jesus wants you to be. And last, Paul mentions training in righteousness. Right? This is the knowledge and the practice that's put into place that's helping you move towards Jesus in a way from sin. So this is what helps you develop your character, a character that reflects Jesus. Right? So we have these four things that Paul says all Scripture is profitable for these things. Scripture can be used for these things in our lives. So this is the next point. We are led by Scripture because of its uses. Because of its uses. It's a valuable tool in our lives right? because it keeps pointing us to Jesus. It points us to Jesus over and over again. Now, one thing that we recognize in these four uses is they are useful first for us as individuals, right? As we are reading and digging into the scriptures on our own, the Holy Spirit will teach and convict and correct and train us in that, right? So first, we must examine ourselves through the lens of the scriptures and allow the scriptures to do its work in us. But then also, this is something that is good to be used as a church, to do these things together as a community, right? To use the scriptures to teach each other, to hold each other accountable, to even correct each other, to train each other up. And this is what the scripture is used for in a church setting like this. When this is a part of our DNA, it should be obvious that these things are happening within our community. Now, where some people have a bad experience is when someone starts to uh, thump the Bible over their head and say, you got to get your life straightened out because the Bible says so. My response to that is we have to remember the first two values that we've already talked about, grace and love. I'm fully convinced that any teaching, any reproof, any correction, any training that comes from one person to, an, to another has to come from a place of grace and love. Because that's where the Holy Spirit's coming from for us. Because that's how Jesus treats us. And so for, for us to be people that are led by biblical truth are people that are using biblical truth responsibly. right? To, to use it first for ourselves, to evaluate ourselves first, to teach and convict and train and correct ourselves, but then also carefully and responsibly sharing the truth with others from a place of grace and love. Right? Because the, the truth is, to share the truth of the scriptures with grace and love does not mean that you have to change the truth. We don't change the message by any means. The message stays the same, but we approach people with the same grace and the same love that Jesus shows each of us. So we are led by biblical truth because it's useful and it's profitable for us. It's the language that Paul uses. All right, look, looking at verse 17, Paul goes on to say that the man of God may be, equi may be complete, equipped for every good work. So it seems in here that Paul is saying because of the message, because of the origin, because of how useful it is, this is the result or the outcome of someone who continues in what they've learned and have firmly believed. Someone who uses the scriptures as a, as a map, this is the outcome. So the first result that he says, being led by scripture, is, means that the person or the, the man of God or the person of God may be complete. So this, this phrase, may be complete, is referring to this idea of maturity. 
It doesn't mean without fault or without error, but a general maturity of someone who is committed to God and committed to working in his kingdom. So we have this idea that an outcome of Scripture is being made complete. But also Paul says to be equipped for every good work. To be equipped for every good work. So the, this, the idea here is that Paul is trying to convey to Timothy that the Scriptures contain everything that he needs to, pre, to be prepared for the kingdom work that God has set out for him. The Scriptures contain everything that he needs to face whatever it is that is coming his way. Think about it this way for me for a second. A couple years ago, uh, in the wintertime, my wife and I, uh, we were having some issues with our furnace, and so we called a repair guy. I think his name was Devin or something like that. Um, we'll go with that. Um, so he came out, and he had a truck that had, he had tools in it that he needed to fix the problem, and he had, he had the experience, he had the training that he needed, and so I was confident in the work that he was going to do. But can you imagine if Devin would have showed up, knocked on the door, had no tools whatsoever, and he was like, oh yeah, this is like the first furnace I've ever worked on, um, but I'm good to go. Like, I I should be all right to do this. Um, I probably would have given him a little bit of a funny look because he would not have been equipped with tools or experience or training to do the job that was set out before him, right? The same goes for us as believers. We cannot do the work that is set out before us without being equipped. And so this verse is saying that the scriptures are one of the ways that God equips us for his work. And so we can say that the better that we know and live by God's word, the better we can live and work for his kingdom. The better we'll be equipped. The more we're in this word, the better we will be equipped. And so we see that because the scriptures are breathed out by God, because they have this incredible message They become very useful for us, and they result in us being equipped for every good work. So here's the last point. We are led by Scripture because of its outcomes, because of its outcomes. The truth is, for some of us here today, you know that God is calling you to something. God is calling you to something, and maybe it's something that you need to do, that you're supposed to do today. Maybe it's something that you were supposed to do last week. Whatever it is, God is calling you to something, and you don't feel capable or adequate to do it. My encouragement to you would be to dig through the Scriptures, to see how God has used others who did not feel like they could do it, and God still used them. Look at Moses, who said, I can't talk very well. Look at Joseph, who was a prisoner. Look at Rahab, who was a prostitute. The list goes on and on and on of people that God uses, unlikely people that God uses in unlikely unlikely situations. We see that God is faithful to those who follow him. Right? Allow the stories and the teachings of the scriptures to give you the confidence and the tools to follow what God is calling you to do. Because the reality is, as we look at this big idea of people that are being led by biblical truth, this means that we need to be people that are holding true to what the scripture says, but we also need to be people who are allowing the scriptures to prepare us and equip us for that kingdom work. Because we don't stop at the knowledge, we put it into practice. Right? It is one thing to know everything in this word, it's a different thing to actually live it out. And to be led by biblical truth doesn't mean you just know what's in the book. It means you live it out. That's what it means for biblical truth to be a part of our DNA. To be people who know it and live it out. So the scriptures are our map. The guide that we follow. And we know that we can trust it. Because of its message. Because of its origin. We can trust it because it's useful and profitable to us, because it equips us for every good work. And so my encouragement for you today is to gain a fresh commitment to God's word, to the scriptures. You may say, I believe it. You may say, I trust it. You may even say, I love it. 
but do you live in it? Do you live it out? And so during our last song, I want, I want you to consider what, what is one way that you can find a renewed commitment to spending time in God's Word, to spending time in learning and growing in who you are as a child of God through His Scriptures, growing in your relationship with Jesus, growing in learning and uh, living out biblical truth. If at any point in that time you would like to pray with somebody, our elders and pastors are going to be at the front and the back of the sanctuary. We're wearing blue lanyards, uh, so it's easy for you to find us. Come and find us. We'd be honored to pray with you. So at the beginning of the message uh, today, you heard a story about uh, Lieutenant George DeLong and how he lost his life because he trusted a faulty map. Right? If you're going to go to the North Pole, you need an accurate map. If you're going to follow Jesus, you need an accurate map. If we have a desire for, for sure church to continue in the kingdom work that God has called us to, to continue to follow Jesus, we must remain committed to being led by biblical truth. It must be a part of who we are. It must be in our DNA because the truth that we find in the scriptures is what keeps bringing us back and, and focusing us back in on Jesus and the work that he has set out for us. And so these words from Paul, remain in what you have learned and have firmly believed so that you may be complete and equipped for every good work. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the sacred writings and scriptures that you have given us and that the Holy Spirit has uh, worked through in tremendous ways, Lord, in which we have this book we call the Bible today. Lord, may we be people that know and live out the truth that is found in it. May we trust it and live by it. May we teach each other, correct each other, train each other, Train each other up with grace and love as you have done the same for us. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. As you go into your life, may the very words that God breathed equip you for every good work you are sent out. Mm -hmm.